I want to thank uh, World Archery. This is MJ Rogers. I'm one of the uh, Paralympic coaches from the USA and uh, have been involved in the sport for a number of years in uh, many facets of the sport. And the last 10 years, uh, primarily focused with adaptive archery and Paralympic archers. And because of that, it's uh, it's somewhat of a duty for me to be able to share some information that I have gleaned over the number of years. And to that end, the, the hope is to uh, pique interest, uh, entice other coaches to become involved in the adaptive side of archery that uh, know full well everyone has a passion about and a willingness to share that with others and show uh, that there is uh, such an inclusive side of archery and uh, show that uh, virtually anyone that you come in contact with, uh, regardless of age or ability or functionality, uh, can participate in bow. And uh, to that, I'm going to have a couple of segments here uh, speak initially to uh, some qualities that I think uh, that uh, behoove a, a, a coach to understand when uh, working with uh, anyone, but certainly uh, with someone that, that has either an intellectual or physical or visual challenge and uh, uh, be able to uh, advance th their skills, their wants in a sport that uh, truly is inclusive. So uh, without further ado, let's begin. This is my information and feel free, this is what I do. Fortunately, I uh, uh, don't have a real job anymore. I uh, coach archers and interact with archers and help with events and d do all sorts of things. And uh, uh, one of them uh, certainly uh, behind my passion is to assist other coaches and other athletes in uh, the endeavor of archery. So uh, feel free free to uh, contact me as, as needed. So let's get started with some uh, sk skills that uh, are, I think, a very much a benefit to a coach. And uh, the, certainly it, it starts primarily with connections. You need to be connected in uh, many facets as a coach, uh, certainly to the athlete, but uh, it's, it's more encompassing than that. You, you are connected to a community, to a federation, to an organization, to a club, to uh, caregivers, to the, the uh, rounded uh, group that includes the athlete. And to that, it's necessary to be open-minded in, in the inclusion part of it, the, that uh, an awareness of those that are uh, timid about venturing into sport, those that are uh, uh, rehabilitation groups that have some concerns about uh, uh, the, the word archery or as a weapon or uh, dangerous or all those things, you have to, to make a connection and show that there are opportunities in a, a great ma manner for those that have physical or intellectual challenges and, and show that uh, either through uh, my presentations or others uh, like me that have uh, been able to share information, there are opportunities out there. And it's relatively easy to make the the, uh, that sort of awareness known. And, and to that, it, you'll find that change is normal. Uh, from here forward, as you work with adaptive athletes, as you work with adaptive programs, you'll find that the, the, their world is in flux, whether it's a, a, a terminal disease or whether it's a changing disease or whether they're uh, uh, becoming stronger or more able uh, and, and that's a that's a, a very relative term because the the individuals that that we deem 
as what we think are normal are those that uh, function in their world day to day. So uh, if it's an amputee that only ha has a left arm, they, they operate the entire day with just the left arm that, and think nothing of, of it. Uh, it, it, are, it is those of us on the outside looking in that uh, can't see how that uh, is possible. And, and to that, you're going to uh, know that it, you have to approach this uh, in a non-judgmental ju non manner. And the non-judgmental is your life is different than their life. Consequently, you have to be okay with whatever conditions they are bringing to and with you. The, whether it is someone with a physical disability or whether it is someone with an intellectual disability or whether it is whatever their life challenge, it, they have approached you, they have approached the club or the, the federation with a want to uh, develop their sports skill. And you uh, have the, the onus of being that individual that has that charge. And to that, you're going to follow that uh, whole process in that it's athlete-centered. It, it all uh, is pivotal on their want or need. And how it develops <clears throat> is, uh, is their focus, uh, not the not the focus of the caregiver or the, the focus of the, the, the group, uh, we need more um, whatever athlete. It's the athlete that uh, needs to be the, the primary in, the, uh, in your objective as uh, providing the, the information to the athlete. And, and it's necessary to have a communication skills to have the ability to interact at any level, whether it's a youngster or whether it's a, a, a veteran or whether it's a community, you, you have a, a, an obligation to hone a skill that is communication and it's an honest dialogue. Uh, it's saying that, that um, in, in most instances, the individuals that you will work with are, uh, they're not going to be Paralympians. You're there to provide a service to a group that is looking to include archery as one of their rehabilitation services. And you have to explain, okay, well, this is going to go only so far, but it can be as, as grand or as, as meager as you wish it to be. And the honest dialogue just, care, just is a part and parcel of how you interact with the athlete, explaining the, the situations. And the, the dialogue comes from a knowledge base. And a reaching out to a source, whether it's World Archery, or whether it's the Archery of Americas, or whether it's myself, or uh, any number of coaches that have been involved with adaptive or Paralympic archers, that trust me, that they are very, very willing to share that sort of information and provide you uh, questions for adapting a release aid, or uh, working with a mouth tab, or uh, whatever the, the need is, uh, that knowledge is out there. And, and so your communication with the, the group or the individual is based upon those. And the, the, those are resources that you can utilize, just a, the gamut. And, and even more so with this, uh, this uh, virus that is going around, that, um, you've seen... Uh, a great influx of information from sports psychologists, from sports physiologists, from 
uh, groups that uh, want to maintain activity level within their athletes and their uh, club groups, uh, the, the Zoom, which you're participating in now, has just exploded with resources that are out there. So I, I really implore you to, to go and see um, what is available that were heretofore very, very expensive, and now it's online and it's free. And, and that, that shows a bit of commitment on, from, from you as the coach, as the instructor, as the, the trainer, that you're willing to learn and be there. You're the, you're the, the go-to for the group. You're the go-to for the club. And the, to that, it's necessary for in the, whether a one-on-one -on -one or a, a meeting or a, a learn is to be there and, and be committed to being there. Learn and apply and uh, be willing to uh, share the information. Uh, all the while you're observing what's going on. You're observing uh, in an athlete setting if it is a group that uh, if there is confusion uh, by an individual, uh, whether they're uh, whether it's an Asperger's or an autistic or it's a veteran, and uh, if there is noise or a specific light or a, a, a confined space, you're watching to make sure that that doesn't deteriorate from the program or from the learning environment. You're also learning to see how there is a growth within that group setting or the individual setting. You, you, one of the, the coolest pieces is uh, I volunteer at a, a local disabled sports chapter and archery is one of the programs. And it's, it's selfish on my part because I go there to learn from these athletes. And uh, one young man who is autistic that came in just uh, uh, very sullen and uh, withdrawn. And over the course of a six or eight week period, he was uh, chiding back. He was uh, uh, integrated with the group he was uh, uh, working with. He was uh, uh, just being involved where uh, previous was uh, held back by whatever the circumstances, but archery, the sport, allowed him that opportunity for growth. And your commitment, your uh, need to understand that there, it, it's a team effort, regardless of whether it is a complete team or whether it's an individual. That individual has uh, support behind them. And th that uh, becomes a part of the team, whether it's funding or whether it's transportation or whether it's uh, encouragement, regardless, uh, you're the, the centerpiece of that uh, team and, and you provide the guidance. You are the, the uh, resource, you're the, the person that is going to uh, facilitate their wants and needs. So the, there's basics that are uh, tied to the, the learning, the, the skills that you need as a coach and bow mechanics. I'm the first to admit, I'm not the best bow mechanic out there. I don't have to be. I know people that if, uh, if things go to a critical mass, that uh, either uh, one of the athletes or one of the other support staff is there and can do the tear down, fix and, and repair. But I know enough. I know enough that in a crisis situation, I can fix it. So the, the know enough is when something is way out of time or a brace height is, is goofy or the, a lot of the, the basic things that get overlooked by the, the athlete in the chaotic uh, competition realm, you have to be observing and you have to know enough to either switch a bow out or fix a bow in a relatively uh, quick 
and resourceful man. And you're always outside the box. You're always thinking, well, how am I going to do? Because when you work in the adaptive world, very, very uh, often what you're working with is uh, not normal. You have an adaptive release aid trigger. You have uh, a, a chair that uh, has a, a strapping device. You have uh, a power unit for a wheelchair that is goofy. Uh, I can't tell you the number of uh, fireflies that over the past year I've worked with. And it has nothing to do with archery, but it was necessary for me to, to be able to do that to provide a comfort level to the athlete. It, that's that's my responsibility as the the coach. So it's it's an outside the box thinking, and uh, ultimately when things don't uh, piece together, we'll find some duct tape and tape it up and and uh, proceed until the the whole mechanic part of it can get fixed. It, always learning, it never stops, and that's the intriguing part for me as a coach that I, the, the opportunities as this is, allow me to learn on an ongoing basis. Seeing things, understanding a life situation, a budgetary situation, uh, a, a functionality, I, I constantly learn and am equally adapting as the athlete is. So I'm always looking for source materials. At the conclusion, I will uh, have a, a listing and I will send uh, to World Archery a Dropbox folder that will have a, a, a lot of the stuff that I use as sources whether it's books or whether it's a, a number of video clips or whether it's just photos of uh, the equipment that the resourceful individuals that you are uh, about to uh, partake or, or be involved with are, uh, are there. And uh, uh, certainly sharing it uh, is, is an easy part on my side. And uh, a lot of it is just observations. Uh, as uh, traveled around the world, take a number of photos of, oh, wow, why didn't I think of that before? Or that, that, that's so simple, that, uh, that, that triggering mechanism, or that, uh, that, that change in the way that the sight moves, or the, the hand in the bow, or uh, other support uh, mechanisms that are there are just uh, so advantageous. And, and to that end, uh, the mentors that I have uh, been fortunate to be involved with, uh, very, very critical. So, so source out uh, someone that you trust or is willing to assist and utilize their uh, information as guides, uh, rules, study enough regardless of the competition, whether it's a simple indoor event or whether it's uh, the uh, Paralympic Games or whether it's World Championships, study enough to know and be competent in what rules are critical to the needs of your team and the individual. Uh, find the officials and make sure that they're understanding that you're on their side that you want to work with them uh, through uh, equipment inspection, through the measurements of the athlete, through the, the drawing of the bows in a safe manner. You're a, a part and parcel of how they see uh, your group when they come to be observed. And it, you, it's necessary to cooperate. And is when that occurs, that, that officials are on your side and they see that you're making the cooperative effort, then they're, they're much more willing to if there is an issue on the line where an athlete has to make a, a quick restroom run or that uh, as they 
retrieve arrows and come back to the line and they're an amputee, it's necessary sometimes for just a slight delay before that whistle to restart so that they can get into their uh, chair properly. It's just a, a matter of um, being a, a willing to uh, and be a participant in all those segments. We'll have uh, uh, questions that will come through and again, feel free to contact me uh, with any questions uh, or through uh, World Archery. Uh, very, very happy to make that happen. So we're gonna proceed and utilize your time <clears throat> uh, at, at best with a segment that will have, <clears throat> excuse me, some photos and some information as things evolve in, uh, in part and work with someone with the challenge. Uh, this young lady is uh, visually impaired. So it's necessary for th that coach, that instructor, to help with the, the feel of the, uh, the knock uh, because that's, that's their perceptors, that they're tactile learners, uh, the, the, the feel of uh, the, the grip, the, the feel of the abrasiveness of the strength. And uh, to that, what you will do in providing them information is uh, communication, but it's also going to be tactile as far as uh, that guidance goes. Uh, th this young lady uh, has hands that are reversed. And so we figured out a way for her to, to be at a level to the target. And with a little support, uh, by me, uh, she was able to uh, draw and, and shoot a bow uh, uh, pretty successfully. The, uh, this young lady uh, has a relatively severe cerebral palsy. And it, again, assisting someone that heretofore had never experienced uh, shooting. I like to, at my uh, presentations, my seminars, for the organizer to bring someone in just like this. Never shot a bow, never participated. And yet uh, the group was able to observe, well, how do you make this happen? With a little support with the bow and because her dexterity and her fingers are not enough to draw the bow, I help uh, with the, the drawing action, but she's engaged with it. And the engagement is accounting. So, uh, as, as we were able to release together, we go, she says, three, two, one, and we both release together. So in unison, we participate in the sport of archery. So the, the engagement and the inclusion happens. Similar, this is a, a young man uh, that is visually impaired and the, the coach is supporting him and guiding him in a manner uh, that is uh, safe, upright, pointed towards the target. And similarly uh, with the bow hand is that uh, they're making sure that uh, his hand is supported in the right positions. A Couple of clips here. This is Lauren and uh, Get ahead of myself. So uh, Lauren shoots archery because, and she turns to her dad and says, "Because my arm doesn't work." And 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 that's that. That's their perception of, okay, why am I here? Is because I'm I, I'm disabled. And the reality is, uh, as you'll see here in a minute, she's going to say why she's truly there. There we go, because I like it. Boom, there you go. 
that's how, that's how we do things. That that the next is this is Elizabeth. Elizabeth has anataxia, so she has a neurological disorder that affects her uh, functionality, and and it looks as though it's debilitating, and yet. Uh, Elizabeth's probably one of the best archers on the team uh, because her what what we think as uh, coordination is an, an internal function. So her head and her eyes that constantly move, they still coordinate one another. And uh, we were at a, a archery range uh, buying uh, Elizabeth a bow, and I looked in the the gentleman behind the counter that had made this sale was wondering, how is this happening? She's shooting eights and nines and tens uh, at a target and she's uh, constantly wiggling. So the, the presumptive of, okay, <clears throat> this can't work is uh, someone else's opinion. So you're gonna be able to change that. This is an adaptation uh, to an, an archer, uh, uh, Keith, his left arm, uh, is uh, relatively non-functional. So in his um, manner, he has a, a regular trigger release aid that's attached to a bicycle cable. And that bicycle cable comes right around and in his secured hand, he just will squeeze and that will pull this trigger. So here we go. And that's how that happens. But from uh, Slovakia uh, at the games, another adaptation. And the adaptation is without his forearm, without the, the fingers, he needed a way to trigger the release. Well, that, that's just something that he came up with that uh, functions as his forearm. And you'll see this nub, and that's what it's called, it's a nub, that will come around and it's going to operate that paddle, which will then operate the trigger of the release. Just that simplistic and that easy. I, again, I can't, imp I cannot impress upon you more how I learn with these youngsters. This young man had a stroke uh, as an infant, and uh, his right side is uh, virtually non-functional. So we're shooting with a mouth tab, and and the the interactions uh, between he and the the learn of the sport is just incredible, and he allows me to be a part of that. Uh, this is a, a man from uh, Mexico with an industrial accident that uh, when I first met him, he uh, hadn't been injured more than six months, so it, it, but had a, a, a great passion to, to learn how to shoot a bow. And uh, this is about a year or more later, and uh, he has uh, figured out a setup where he can brace against the bow and a, a mechanism that's attached again to a nub and uh, he's shooting a fingerless release against his chin and um, made it happen because his willingness and because of the support of those around him. A Paralympian uh, archer that is assisting uh, another archer, uh, Leah Coriel at, at a We Can Do camp, uh, two wheelchair ladies and uh, they're, sh they're sharing the sport. They're uh, participating in archery, and uh, so that it it breaks down the barrier of, wow, uh, I can do this, and because she's in a wheelchair, I have seen uh, and know that uh, I'm capable. A young man uh, that uh, again had lost the function of his left arm, and so he's uh, participating with a mouth tab. 
the, the Maltab is, uh, is uh, not necessarily a stopgap, but it, it's a very, very easy way for someone that has a fun only function of one arm, right, one arm and allows them to shoot a bow. One of the, the pieces uh, to be aware of, let's see if I can kind of pause this where we can find, oh, right, okay. What you can't see is that the, the typical mouth tab, when it's made, is too big. And for beginners, that's okay. But as accuracy, in, uh, the accuracy is there. Uh, the successes between Eric Bennett and uh, the, the young man from France, that just some incredible scores uh, shooting a mouth tab. So it can happen. So this uh, was uh, a production release uh, through Trueball uh, called a Fingerless. It is out of production. However, uh, uh, Mr. Armless Archer, Matt Stutzman, is in process of prototyping or evaluating a prototype, another one from Trueball that uh, allows uh, for someone uh, with no hands or with limited functionality of fingers uh, to shoot a bow. Hopefully by end of year, you'll begin to see this. And this is it in action. And you see that it, it's braced against the chin. Excuse me. Leah uh, Coriel has a limited function of her hands. So that the, all she does uh, with the, the wrist uh, band is able to just pull firmly against and that's what operates that trigger. Uh, John Walker, uh, Paralympian, uh, this apparatus from John actually started out from uh, a U.S. Uh, football pad. Uh, it was just ha that had been cut in half and uh, the mechanism is uh, uh, triggering through a pull cord. So you'll see that, that through that uh, carabiner and the attachment on the shoulder pad, there's this cord and it goes down and uh, John just hooks a, a finger in that carabiner and as he uh, pulls on the, that carabiner, it operates the trigger. This uh, another young man that had a, a stroke and uh, his apparatus is similar to what uh, Eric Bennett used for a number of years. And uh, the design is, uh, somewhat unique in that it's the, the shoulder apparatus, certainly, but uh, its attachment is somewhat different. Uh, and the, the triggering is somewhat different in that it uh, is operated uh, through a cord uh, and through uh, the clothespin. So he has this clothespin that's attached to the cable that winds right around his back and to the triggering mechanism on the release aid. And as he uh, does a bite here, it operates the trigger. So what's unique about uh, many of the shoulder units is this uh, particular attachment. And I, I'm kind of fond of it, uh, this, this design, in that it best replicates, I feel, uh, how uh, someone with a, a shoulder mounted uh, release aid or prosthetic uh, can uh, perform at a, a high level in archery. And the attachment is uh, virtually right on top of where his scapula is. And so instead of being at the top of the shoulder as an attachment, well, where there's a lot of um, range of motion that can get in the way from the, the real function of shooting a bow, this more, like, more replicates what you're looking to have happen uh, in the sport. Another prosthetic, uh, this came out of uh, somebody's garage. They uh, said, well, I have this, uh, this arm. Uh, how can I make this adapt to a bow? Well, uh, they, uh, they made this clamp and it's attached via a, a binder for a ski or snowboard. And it ratchets around uh, the bow handle and positions it so that 
<coughs> excuse me, um, holds the, the bow in place and yet it allows the bow to articulate, which is uh, one of the rules. Uh, similarly, uh, here, an attachment for uh, an, uh, a man that uh, has, uh, had, uh, still has, severe burns uh, to arms. Uh, it's a strapping mechanism. And yet, uh, again, to comply, it is uh, not fastened securely. So it, al it allows that arm uh, in the bow to uh, function as a separate unit. It, it, it's required to articulate just as if it were someone's wrist. Props. Props come in all different sizes. This is one that's a manufacturer, uh, but uh, they can be homegrown. They, the, uh, the tripod for security and the ability to stake it down and the adjustability for height uh, for someone that needs that sort of support. This is a vis visually impaired stand uh, with the tripod mounted as an integral part of the stand so that alignment is relatively easy to uh, secure. Foot positioners for the archer to uh, left foot, right foot, and can be set up either left-handed or right hand. And then the, the sight as well is just a, a, a typical sight with the uh, aperture now is a tactile aperture. So they'll, it will touch to the back of, typically the back of their hand. And as it moves up, down, left, right, it provides them the information that's necessary uh, to sight and shoot a bow. And once, once this is positioned in competition, then uh, the visually impaired of the VI archer is uh, just like any other archer, they hear the two whistles and they come to the line. They hear the one whistle, and they load arrows and they go. This is uh, just another uh, photo of it in action. As you can see, uh, those positioners uh, determine where his feet are located as far as a reference. Similarly, the, that tactile is against the back of his hand so that he has the, virtually the same sighting apparatus as anyone else and makes the same corrections. Uh, and this, this is uh, a pretty um, elaborate setup, but uh, th it doesn't have to be this elaborate. Uh, positioners for the foot, uh, positioners uh, that uh, replicate uh, the tripod and this sighting device, uh, you, can, you can do that in a relatively uh, quick manner for someone that that wants to come in and participate. When I first learned to shoot, I was a, a young child with two arms. And when I was 15 years old, I was in a rollover car accident. In that car accident, I lost my right arm above the elbow. And at that time, I thought that I would never shoot my bow again. Being a disabled athlete missing my upper limb, one of the first challenges I encountered with shooting a recurve bow was stringing the bow. So I wanted to show you just a quick adaptive piece that I created to be able to string my bow and then show you how I use it. The main piece that you would need to build or create that's an adaptive piece is simply a strap with a hook on it. That hook is going to hook onto the grip of the bow. Then you just need any type of standard stringing bow string stringer. That goes on the same way that any type of stringing device would go on. And then once you get this in place, then you can proceed with stringing the bow. Now I'm gonna show you how I use this adaptive piece to string my bow. This hook right here is a standard bow hook that you can get at just about any bow shop. It hangs on your belt and allows you to hang your bow. And then I have a strap attached to that with a loop on the end. The loop is going to be for my foot. I use the bow hook because it's easy to put on and take off my bow, but you could use any type of uh, rope or strap that you wrap around the handle of the bow. I take the grip of the bow and I just hang the bow hook on there. And you can see the strap hangs down with the foot loop. But I put the loop on the ground. I step into it with my foot. You can see that I'm pulling up on the stringer now and I'm putting a little tension there. Then I'm gonna bend down and put the stringer onto my shoulder. Once I do that with my hand, place the stringer where I want it to, and then I just need to simply stand up 
and that will flex the bow enough that I can then put my string on the limb. Then I just have to lean back down again to put the pressure on my bow string. Then I can step out of my loop, take my hook off, and then also take the stringer off. And then once I get those done, my bow's strung and ready to shoot. So the, we talk about a little bit about classification and classification groups. Uh, again, realize that more often than not, what you will be working with uh, on the uh, individual or group settings that they're not going to classify. The, the, the guidelines and the governance uh, for uh, uh, competitive uh, Paralympic archers are such that um, the, the typical challenged athlete uh, won't fit those parameters. So be aware of that in, in your communications. So that, that there are, in essence, there are three classifications. It, this will say uh, non-eligible, which means that they don't classify. A standing, uh, a standing as far as uh, either a compound or recurve, and a W1 or W2. A W1 is the most uh, impaired in that they have uh, upper and lower body and core impairments. And a W2 is someone that, that has a lower body and uh, uses a, a wheelchair, but uh, they, they have functionality in their upper body. And uh, you're more than uh, capable of reading it. You don't need me to uh, fully explain. But it's something that you need to know as you approach uh, working with someone that has the potential to be a, a Paralympic athlete, to be a, a competitor on the world stage or a competitor uh, on the national uh, level and uh, give them the, the proper guidance and the proper tools to learn uh, what is required and what are allowances. And to that end, uh, through classifications, there are allowances made within a, a specific classification. So if I'm a standing and yet I uh, am or have the potential to be unstable, I can, uh, the classifier will put on the classification card that uh, a prop is allowed or some sort of, of a supportive device whether it's a bipod or whether it's a tripod or whether it's a full seat and uh, whether that's, that seat is that they are upright or whether that, that seat is uh, lower to the ground. And the, the primary concern comes from the classifiers and from uh, world archery in uh, safety, not only to the athlete themselves, but safety to the, the community and competitors around them. It's uh, that, uh, that type of um, obligation is uh, part and parcel to the classifications. Uh, I know uh, classifiers uh, often get a bad rap, uh, but they're, they're doing a job. And uh, that's another one that's necessary to, to uh, work within the system that is currently uh, available. And if changes need to be uh, made, uh, certainly that will be addressed uh, in uh, days and weeks and years to come. I shoot with a prosthetic arm. It winds up being like shooting almost identical to a guy with two hands. Other than my release, it's just been modified just a little bit to fit in the prosthetic. The lighter the trigger you have, the better off you're going to be, the easier the shot's going to be. The easier it's going to be to make it fluid rather than punching. So my release, instead of being on a wrist strap or handheld, it's mounted to a bracket. This quick disconnect right here is very standard industry-wide for prosthetics. What I like about this one is that it allows you to get 
360 degree rotation. So this release is mounted rigid once it's plugged in here. The only way I can get my rotation that I need to get my proper alignment on my jawbone is to have all these, these grooves here. To ensure that I'm always on the same spot or my release comes back the same way, I've indexed the end of my prosthetic so that I just align the two marks and plug it in and then it's ready to go. The shooting prosthetic is different than your everyday prosthetic. For starters, this has no harness. I get as much movement as I possibly can, especially inward. I can't straighten the arm out because of the way the socket's built. And the elbow comes up higher, which allows when I pull, the prosthetic doesn't move. The other thing is my liner. So this liner slides over my arm and then it has a locking pin on it. And then this locking pin locks down into a mechanism in this prosthetic. And once it's locked in, it won't come off. If you're gonna do this, you definitely wanna look at having a locking mechanism on your prosthetic. The shots is not gonna look a ton different than anybody else shooting. You just hook your arrow up and then hook the release up. I've indexed my release so that I know that once I draw this back, it's not gonna turn on me. It's gonna come and set on my jaw just like it needs to. If you have a heavy trigger and you got your head in position, you don't want to move a whole bunch of this. So if you have a real heavy trigger, you're going to have to really push on it or really get that jawbone in there. And with a light, not dangerous trigger, you just a little bump with the jawbone and you're in there. Don't be scared to fail. I've done it a million times. So the how-to with classifications. This is uh, somewhat of a need to know. When uh, an athlete goes in to get classified, if you don't have a medical person that is part of your staff, or you don't have a medical person that is aware, uh, you as the coach should, should, or a female staff, depending upon the gender, as uh, to the athlete, uh, you need to have a, a, a rough idea of where are these points going to come from and what are the points that are necessary to get someone classified. Again, we're not going to go through a lot of detail with this, but it's enough uh, that you need to know where these points come from. The, the upper body and uh, the, the different joints that have point value, the core, the hips, uh, knees, ankles, all of those things generate uh, points. And then that determines uh, where or what is provided in the classification for that given athlete. Another uh, for uh, the W1, again, is um, uh, most severely impaired, often uh, would be a quadriplegic in that uh, they have uh, three limbs that are impaired, uh, upper and lower body, and uh, they have a very limited uh, function of core. And uh, because of that, and because again of uh, a need for uh, safety concern, often uh, the W1 classification is allowed strapping. And uh, that's something that you uh, as a coach and uh, the athlete will experiment with what strapping works, whether it's a crisscross strap or whether it's just one uh, single strap uh, that's uh, supporting them uh, tied to the, the chair or uh, tied to the, the push handles or where they are most comfortable and the, the most um, uh, best situated to be able to, to shoot a bow. And uh, allowances are made uh, through the classification and through the process of how wide that strap can be and uh, where that strap can be located and all of the parameters. Again, uh, there's a, a wealth of information within uh, World Archery's uh, guidelines and the, there's a classifier's handbook even that uh, is uh, certainly worth delving into as you uh, become much more involved uh, within uh, the sport. 
the W-2 again, that they're, they're wheelchair users. They are those that uh, have an impairment in the lower body and use a, a wheelchair to, uh, for mobility and uh, they can participate either as a recurve or a compound. And, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's, a, a, it's a different process to uh, work with somebody that is a W-2 shooting a recurve. You have to think about, I had a conversation just a, little, uh, a couple of days ago uh, with uh, one of the US uh, archers in a wheelchair and uh, her push rim, uh, the, the lower limb of her bow uh, keeps strike, striking the, her wheel. And uh, it's not necessarily damaging the bow, but it's aggravating, it, it's a nuisance. And it's, it gets into the head of, okay, am I, is, it, is this thing gonna blow up on me? So just be aware as you uh, work with somebody that is um, in a wheelchair, that considerations around whether it's a compound or a recurve, it's functionality. Uh, one, one specific that uh, you, you'll see here often, you know, it's, uh, specifically to a wheelchair user that is using a compound, uh, typically a little more mass weight, uh, that, that they won't fit the normal of positions. So they're gonna lean a little bit more than what you would think would be uh, correct in uh, all the archery instructor books that you see. So just uh, uh, be aware that that sort of thing has happened. And again, I, I hope that in some small way, what uh, is here uh, has piqued an interest for you At some point, to learn what a great honor uh, to stand in a box like this. This is in Rio and uh, be just a small piece of uh, some incredible accomplishments. And and speaking of that, uh, these are archers. These are athletes that you are working with. Uh, treat them as such. Uh, to the outside world, they're inspiration. And uh, given the, the current situation around the world, we need inspiration. However, their, inspirational, their inspiration comes from being that athlete. They uh, want to be the best in the world and not those that, oh, isn't that nice? They are shooting a bow. No, they're athletes and they're archers and they want, they want you to give them their best, give them your best and uh, provide in uh, all sorts of manners, whether it's through uh, uh, communication or whether it's support or or whether it's uh, passing them along to someone that has a, a larger uh, wealth of knowledge along the way, it, it's, uh, it, it is your obligation and it's your duty and it is uh, such a reward to be just a, a small piece of um, uh, just some incredible accomplishments. And, and I hope that, uh, I hope someday, you get to stand where I'm standing uh, in 2016, and I, I, I sincerely plan in uh, 2021, a year from now, to be standing in one of those boxes watching uh, a, a match that uh, is <laughs> going towards the, that, that uh, once in uh, four years uh, gold medal. It, what a, an incredible opportunity for a, a coach at any level 
to uh, aspire to that and, and know that uh, you were a, a small portion of how and, and why uh, and the purpose behind that. That's, a, that's the share of, of the humanity that we are all a part of. And, and what a great honor and what a great opportunity to be able to, to do uh, such an item. Uh, thank you so very, very much for allowing me uh, to be a, a small part of your day. I, I am uh, greatly appreciative of World Archery allowing me to, to come in and share this information and uh, just a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, reward, I guess. Thank you. Thank you.